the mycelium is embedded in its food source. And wow. that food source could be underground. It could be in a, in a log, uh, on a tree or something like that. So we never see that vegetative body unless you actually get down to the ground. You, you pluck the mushroom out and you look underneath and then you'll see this real kind of fine, white, fuzzy, mold-like growth. That is the mycelium. You're listening to A New Way of Living with Dan Voss, inspiring you to a new life of breathwork, cold therapy, nature, and plant medicine. In this week's episode, my guest is Jeff Chilton. Jeff was raised in Pacific Northwest, studied ethnomycology at the University of Washington in the late 60s, and started working on a commercial mushroom farm in Olympia, Washington in 1973. During the next 10 years, he became the production manager responsible for cultivation of, of over 2 million pounds of agaricus mushrooms per year, and was also involved in the research and development of shiitake, oyster, and enoki mushrooms, which resulted in the earliest U.S. fresh shiitake sales in 1978. In the late 70s, he was a founder of Mycomedia, which held four mushroom conferences in the Pacific Northwest. These educational conferences brought together educators and experts in mushroom identification, ethnomycology, and mushroom cultivation. During this period, Jeff co-authored the highly acclaimed book, The Mushroom Cultivator, which was published in 1983. In the 1980s, he operated a mushroom spawn business, and in 1989, he started Namex, a business that introduced medicinal mushrooms to the U.S. nutritional supplement industry. He traveled extensively in China during the 1990s, attending conferences and visiting research facilities and mushroom farms. In 1997, he organized the first organic mushroom production seminar in China. Jeff's company, Namex, was the first to offer a complete line of certified organic mushroom extracts to the U.S. nutritional supplement industry. Namex extracts are used by many supplement companies and are noted for their high quality based on scientific analysis of the active compounds. Jeff, welcome to a new way of living podcast. Dan, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. I can always tell uh, by the extensiveness of uh, someone's bio um, of how how much uh, they how much knowledge they have about a certain topic. And how much expertise you have. Um, you have quite the, the list of accolades in this field. And, uh, you know, a lot of people know you as, as the mushroom guy. So um, for this podcast, you know, talking about plant medicine and mushrooms, whether that's medicinal mushrooms or psychoactive mushrooms, um, it's, it's really exciting to have someone like yourself on the show to not only share your story and the work you're doing, but uh, to help educate us on the many benefits of, of mushrooms. So uh, that being said, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you got started in this field. I know I, I read off your bio and a lot of your, your past history there, um, but I would love to hear it from your own mouth on how you got started, You know what made you interested in, in mushrooms to begin with, um, and if you can maybe just share a little bit more about your, yourself and your background. Sure, well, <clears throat> I was uh, raised in Seattle, Pacific Northwest, you know what we're famous for, of course, is the rain. <laughs> it's one of it's one of the best areas in the world for wild mushrooms. So as I grew up, there were mushrooms all around me, and and I was able to get out and and forage for mushrooms with uh, uh, parents of some friends. And then uh, when I went to university in, in Seattle, University of Washington, my my field of study was anthropology because I was really interested in other cultures, and I I put, you know, I still had this interest in mushrooms. So I put the two together. And so in my anthropological studies, I was studying the use of mushrooms for food, for medicine, and mm. in shamanic ritual use. And, and, and so that became my focus. And, and, and look, Dan, the 60s were full of shamanism, I have to tell you. I mean, it was really quite the, the time. So I, I knew mushrooms quite intimately. And then after, after university, it's like, well, what do you do with a degree in anthropology? Well, mm -hmm. not a whole, not a whole lot. So uh, my mycology professor, as I went to him, I said, I'd really love to learn how to grow mushrooms. He said, there's a mushroom farm 60 miles down the road. Why don't you go down there and ask the owner for a job? And I did, 
I got the job, I was like super excited about that. I ended up being there for the next 10 years, wow. literally living with mushrooms. I mean, this was a big, big farm. And, yeah. and the cool thing about it too, was we were not just growing the button mushroom, but we also had a, a Japanese scientist there who was researching uh, shiitake, oyster mushroom, and noki taki. So I got to see these other mushrooms and how they grew too. So it was just, mm. it was a fantastic time. I really loved it. And like I say, I was literally living with mushrooms because for one, mushrooms never sleep. Mm. <laughs> they never sleep. You know, every single mushroom you've ever eaten has been harvested by hand. Wow. Somebody has actually had to go and pick it and, and snip the bottom off of it. So, so, um, and, and every single day of the year, they are in the rooms harvesting because the crop just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you don't harvest for a couple of days, you've got all sorts of mushrooms and now they're too mature and they're a second instead of a first. So it's a real interesting, um, let's just say, you know, agricultural crop. It's not really mm -hmm. agriculture in the traditional sense. Um, have you ever, have you ever been to a mushroom farm? No, I haven't. It sounds like a pretty neat place. Have you ever, have you ever like even seen one or anything? I don't think I have. I'm going to have to <laughs> yeah. uh, further investigate. Well, you know, the thing about it is, is that, is that that's because they're all grown in indoors, right? I mean, the, most yeah. of the mushrooms, especially in North America, they're grown indoors in big warehouses. You could drive right by a mushroom farm and never even know it's there. So, so it's really kind of one of those things where, where most people are like, I have no idea how mushrooms grow. Yeah, well, huh. that's because you've never seen it. It's not like driving by and seeing fields of corn and vegetables sure. and things like that. So, so it was a really interesting 10 years for me. Um, and, and look, I, I'm really um, very keen on getting people to eat more mushrooms. Mm. Do you, what, do you, do you uh, eat mushrooms uh, much? I do. I don't know. Uh, I, I honestly just grab whatever I find in uh, the grocery store uh, grocery store yeah. aisles. So I don't know. Uh, let's put it this way. I don't necessarily look at the names of the mushrooms very yeah, closely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I do love cooking with, with mushrooms and all kinds of different recipes. Yeah. Well, you know what? And, and I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm eating a lot of mushrooms while I'm working on the mushroom farm and, and I, I've got mushrooms. I'm eating them five nights a week and whatever nice. meals I'm making up. And, and yeah. I, I consider mushrooms to be the forgotten food and, and what yep. I call the missing dietary link. I mean, they have so many benefits mm. for us. I mean, I mean, they are, um, have a, a relatively good profile for amino acids. They're very high in carbohydrates, but the carbohydrates are not starch. They do not contain any starch. They're not like a starchy grain or something like that. Sure. They, uh, the carbohydrate is something called mannitol. It's very slow acting. And, you know, you, you've certainly heard of the slow food movement and just the whole idea of kind of slowing it down, taking your time mm. cooking, uh, yeah. knowing what you're doing, be mindful about preparing and cooking food. Well, well, mushrooms are something that it's very slow moving through. It's not like eating a potato where up goes your glucose and down the other side, you know, or something sure. really sweet. So, sure. so the, the profile of a mushroom, great uh, carbs, mannitol, trehalose. So the mm. profile of mushrooms is really good. And also they're very high in fiber. Mm. So they, um, they're also feeding our microbiome as a prebiotic. So for me, I'm like, whatever you do, put mushrooms into your diet because yep. that's what yep. you are missing. And they will, will provide you not just nutritional benefits, but also benefits in terms of their immunological potentiation. Mm. Yeah, I had uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry on my podcast last year, and he's a huge fan of mushrooms. He's a pretty well-known doctor. He lives in uh, Southern California. and uh, I actually did a podcast with him, too. Oh, you did? Okay, cool. Yes. So you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of him, yeah. Yes, absolutely. No, he's a, he's a wonderful man. He's a great man. guy. Yeah, and I know he had talked about you know the, the nutritional value of mushrooms and how great it is for our microbiome. 
because that's kind of his big, um, you know, spiel is uh, strengthening our microbiome and, you know, what mushrooms can do for our immunity. So yes, there's tons, yes, there. Ex- tons there. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the, what it is in mushrooms, in the mushroom cell wall, there's a compound called the beta glucan. Mm-hmm. And these beta glucans are what give mushrooms their immunological activity. So mm-hmm. when we're eating mushrooms, we are definitely getting the benefits of those uh, beta glucans. We actually have receptor sites in our uh, lower intestines that are uh, specific to these fungal beta glucans. And what wow. happens is they 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 uh, connect to these receptor sites, and then they will stimulate the production of uh, immune cells, macrophages, T cells, um, and then cytokines from that. So so. Those beta glucans, when we're eating mushrooms, we are getting the benefits there. And, and the beta glucans that are in the, the fiber, which um, is like, you know, there's fiber and then there's the um, a soluble fiber. So the beta mm-hmm. glucan is both in the, fi- the actual fiber, the not insoluble beta glucan will just go and feed the microbiome, but we're getting the benefits there. And eating mushrooms, that's why I say for, to everybody, eat mushrooms, but then if you want to supplement, then you can go the next step and you can use mushrooms as as supplements and and a lot of the uh, supplements that we make for example are concentrates mm-hmm. uh, and and uh, um, that for some people works as well okay yeah I'd, I'd love to get into that idea of um supplementation maybe you know towards the end of our conversation here sure uh, absolutely. i'd love to start with the idea of what a mushroom is, you know, you talked a little bit about that, you know, growing cycle, but what is the natural growing cycle of a mushroom? And just on a very basic level, what is a, a mushroom? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, what's interesting about a mushroom is that how do you grow mushrooms? They don't have seeds. So, mm. so Dan, what do we do if we don't have a seed to plant, right? It's like, how do we do this? Yeah. Well, m- mushrooms have spores. Um, in nature, those spores are out on the wind currents. They land on the ground. They land on a piece of wood. They germinate when conditions are right into a very fine thread-like filament. And mm-hmm. when multiple spores uh, um, join together from when germinate, the filaments join together, they fuse, they form a network. That network is called mycelium. Mm. Mycelium is the vegetative body. You, you can almost think of my, mycelium in the sense of, um, for example, there's a, an apple tree. You've got a tree and then you've got the apple, right? We eat the apple. But the structure that creates the apple and feeds that apple from the nutrients it's pulling out of the ground is that tree itself. Uh, so mushrooms can be looked at uh, um, or, or this organism can be seen as uh, a network of mycelium, which is that body that is then ultimately, when conditions are right, going to produce the mushroom. Mm. Uh, so there it is. And, and the thing about it is, is that we never see that. that right. That's what's so weird about mushrooms, right? It's like you're walking down a path and and all of a sudden you go, oh, look, Look at that mushroom there. And you're going, where did it come from? Mm. (laughs) You know, well, the mycelium is embedded in its food source. And and that food source could be underground. It could be in a, in a log uh, on a tree or something like that. So we never see that vegetative body unless you actually get down on the ground, you, you pluck the mushroom out and you look underneath and then you'll see this real kind of fine, white, fuzzy mold like growth. That is the mycelium. Mm. So, so that's the body, the, the vegetative body. It, the mushroom comes up in season, which is here in the fall, because temperatures are down. It starts to rain. Mushrooms need high humidity to grow. Up comes the mushroom. It goes through its stage. It takes about two weeks to mature. And so the cap forms uh, gills underneath the cap. Those gills produce the spores. And the spores are out there. Now we've completed the life cycle. So the important thing here is that is that when you're looking for a supplement, and let's say it's an herbal supplement, you mm-hmm. want to know what you're getting. Are you getting um, the root? 
Like it's, yep. it's ginseng, you want the root. If, if, if it's um, echinacea, you want the flower extract. So mm. the plant part is really important. So the plant parts of this particular fungal organism are spore, uh, mycelium, and mushroom. And mushroom is the plant part that has been used traditionally. That's really the biofactory that's creating all of these amazing compounds. Mm. Um, and, and that's ultimately what we would grow and then either turn into supplements or we would be eating. But that's the key thing, especially when you're going out there looking for supplements. It's like, you know, yeah. okay, does it tell me what plant part this is? Because right. you need to know that in order to properly evaluate what you're buying. Hmm. It seems to me that mushrooms are one of the most complex plants that we have on this planet in terms of their functionality, their uses, just what makes up a, a mushroom as a plant. Uh, it's, it's very complex, but it's... Well, 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 certainly, and you know, it's so so complex actually that they've given it its own kingdom. So we've got the kingdom that's plants, we've got animals, and then in between is the kingdom of fungi. And and mm. it's interesting because they share attributes of of plants and of animals. Like for example, the this fungal organism is breathing just like we breathe in the sense that it brings in oxygen and then exhales carbon dioxide. It also, for its storage carbohydrate, unlike plants, which the storage carbohydrate is starch, a mushroom produces glycogen, just like we do. <laughs> we produce glycogen as our storage carbohydrate. So it's kind of like, wow, that's kind of interesting. You know, in other words, sharing these traits, which look, it's in, in the world of all of the different organisms out there, there's lots of shared attributes of different kind, but it's it's just kind of interesting, you know, this and this kingdom of fungi, it is there's like tens of thousands of millions of different species of, mm. of fungi. And and just for example, when we're talking about these organisms, we'll we'll classify them into um, imperfect fungi and perfect fungi. Imperfect fungi are the ones that grow on your bread. You ever seen a mold on a on a piece of bread? It's like oh, yeah. oh you know, moldy bread, <laughs> right? And and it's like a green mold or a black mold or something. Yeah. Well, okay, so there's a lot of those molds out there of different kinds. And and they're very good at, at uh, breaking down things in the environment because that's what these fungal organs, organisms do is they're breaking down all the organic matter. But mm. the imperfect fungi do not produce a what we would call fruiting body. So they would not be producing a mushroom at all. Got it. Um, all they do is they, they just are in that vegetative state. So it's just mycelium. And then when, when you first see it, actually, it will be kind of white. But if you watch it grow for a few days, the next thing you know, it has turned black or mm. green. And what that is, is those, that color means that it is sporulating. And have you ever heard people say, oh yeah, I'm allergic to mold. Well, mm. what they're talking about actually is mold spores. Mm. So, so in, in homes that are kind of contaminated with molds, what's going on is that the mold will start to grow. And then at a certain point, it will start to create spores and those spores get in the air. People breathe those. And if you breathe enough of them, uh, then you will have an allergic reaction. Wow. So that's, that's where, and look, there's also molds that will get into grain and they'll produce what's called an aflatoxin. Mm -hmm. which is a very dangerous toxin that if you, you eat too much of it, it can poison you. So, so wow. that's kind of like the mold side of things. But on the other side is the perfect fungi. And those are the mushrooms because mm -hmm. it's the mycelium will actually produce this, what we call a fruiting body, which means the mushroom. So those, those are two different distinctive divisions of this very, very big world of fungi. And there's other divisions as well. But those are kind of the two that, that we're most concerned about because they directly affect us. Got it. So so we've talked about the nutritional benefits of of mushrooms. We talked about the growing cycle of mushrooms. How about 
mushrooms as medicine, what are medicinal mushrooms and what are some of the main uses for medicinal mushrooms? Well, the, the major benefit of about every one of these mushrooms because, and they each have some unique benefits, but the major benefit is immunological potentiation. Mm -hmm. That's what, that, that's what the main reason why uh, people are using medicinal mushrooms. That's, that's how they've been used traditionally. And, and that's why for me, making them a part of one's diet is so important because, because it, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, taking a vitamin, for example, or getting vitamins from your food. You need that in a regular way. You, you can't just like, okay, I'm going to take them for a week and that's good. Or, or, oh, I'm going to take them. Hopefully that'll take care of my cold or something. No, you need to be eating them regularly. So immunological potentiation and the mushrooms that, you know, we analyze all of our mushroom products for beta glucans. So we can say this mushroom is much higher in beta glucans. And what we found is that that corresponds in, in a lot of ways to what the scientists are telling us about the immunological activities. So the two mushrooms that come up with the highest amount of beta glucans are reishi and um, turkey tail. Mm. And, 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 and then I, I look out there, turkey tail has actually been de developed into a couple of actual drug products in China and in Japan. And then reishi is so highly revered that you see it in Chinese art, architecture, oh. there's mythologies about it. And, and I, I kind of oh. look at that and I think, well, there's a reason for this. There's a reason why these two mushrooms are sort of held up higher than the, the others. And, and when we get down to the fact of, look, all mushrooms actually have beta glucans, but the, mm -hmm. the issue is that the architecture of each beta glucan is a little bit different. And mm -hmm. so that's what makes uh, one mushroom highly active and another one, no, not so active. Um, and that's where, for example, there would be about what I consider 10 major mushroom species that are truly uh, powerful compared to the others. All of them are going to mm -hmm. provide you a certain level of benefits, but these 10 will give you the uh, a level of benefits that's uh, cut above. And, and so uh, immunological potentiation, reishi, turkey tail, maybe maitake. Mm -hmm. um, have you have you uh, heard or read anything about lion's mane? Yeah, so I, I have a, it's a, actually a CBD product that I use almost on a daily basis. It's got CBD oil, MCT oil, and then it has reishi mushroom and lion's mane. Um, and for me, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on lion's mane and the power of it. Um, but that blend of the reishi, lion's mane gives me nice kind of mental clarity Along with the CBD, it's like a nice kind of calming effect. Um, but yeah, lion's mane. I've also had the uh, Four Sigmatic lion's mane that I will put in my coffee. I've, I've had that before as well. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on lion's mane. What, what do we need to know about lion's mane? Well, well, for one, you know, it's interesting because that you mentioned a CBD product because we sell to many, many different companies that have CBD products. I mean, it's just amazing yeah. that that whole category has grown so quickly, right? Yeah. So a lot of companies come to us and are blending our extracts with some of their CBD products. And Lion's mm. Mane, Lion's Mane has got a lot of very good research that talks about its ability to stimulate what's called nerve growth factor. And nerve growth factor is an amino acid that we produce. And as we get older, we tend to produce less of it. And nerve growth factor stimulates the organization and sometimes the production of neurons. So it's very important mm -hmm. for us. And, and as you're getting older, you start to, you know, have less of this produced. And then you're going like, huh, I can't remember this. I can't remember that. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> anything that can help, of course, is good. So for cognitive enhancement, and that's why most people are using Lion's mane because they consider it to be a high quality nootropic. Mm -hmm. And that, that's sort of an interesting word too, you know, nootropic, because 
that was not even around 10 years ago, right? And all sure. of a sudden, the tropic is like, wow, and there's all, and everybody's looking for something that can promote and benefit us in, okay. in that way, our performance in some way, and mental acuity is, is one of those things. And, and there's actually some clinical trials that have been done with Lion's Mane where they gave uh, 30 volunteers, and they were all approximately 70 years old. Uh, one group got uh, three grams of just lion's mane powder per day. The other was a control group. They gave them a whole battery of tests. After 120 days of, of taking the lion's mane, they gave both groups the test again. And the ones that were taking lion's mane did better on the tests. Now, wow. that, that's just one trial. Um, and sure. then the interesting part about it, um, Dan, was that and they stopped taking the lion's mane and then they tested everybody again 30 days later. And the group that had been taking the lion's mane dropped back down to baseline. And wow. so, so you're kind of like, wow, that's really interesting, right? Yeah, And, and uh, there's a few other clinical trials out there as well. And um, it's, it's um, you know, you have to be careful about all of the initial research in this because they're, they're using it for people with um, early onset dementia, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in different ways, people who are having some kind of cognitive dif uh, difficulties. And so that's primarily where lion's mane has been used. And, and it's interesting that the lion's mane actually was used traditionally for people with some um, uh, alimentary canal issues as well so hmm. that's that's a sort of a side of it just like just like i mean you've got lion's mane and reishi in in a cbd product well reishi is actually something that's been used often for its calming effect mm. so so really that's a pretty good combination in there in fact they even yeah. use it in some cases uh with uh, for insomnia yeah wow yeah, the more people I tell about it, like your, you know, experts like yourself, they they agree that that combo is is a really nice blend between the three. Yeah, um, no, it, it absolutely is. I'm learning is. more about it. Yeah, 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 we we actually have have companies that are are in the cannabis space mm -hmm. that are putting our extracts in with some of their um, edible products. So sure. not just CBD, but even even cannabis now. So um, yeah, that, whole, interesting. that whole arena, it's, it's just so, it's fascinating to, to see. Yeah, it really and, is. and everybody's really, you know, what's happening is there's just a lot of innovation out there right now. People are trying all sorts of different combination, what works and, and, and formulating in many different ways. And now that they've yep. got um, CBD and cannabis to, to work with, my God, it's just yeah. opened up a whole nother realm, hasn't it? It really has. Yeah. The industry is really, really exploding, um, which is exciting. I mean, like you said, we have to pay attention to the research, look into the studies and be careful with some of it. But overall, it seems like the the excitement around it is definitely uh, a step in the right direction for sure. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? Your generation to me is just, it's just there's so many interesting new products, uh, food, yeah. beverage, uh, yep. supplement yep. formulas. I mean, yeah. and, and people like yourself being so plugged into health and, mm. and, and being knowledgeable about that and bringing it to other people. I mean, it's, it's just critical. I mean, I look at what happened here in the last year and a half of the pandemic and I think all of the unhealthy people that for the most part were the majority of those who ended up in trouble Yep. You know, whether it be overweight people or yep. people with very low levels Diabetes. of, yeah, or, or people with low amounts of, uh, of vitamin D that they weren't getting mm. enough vitamin D. So there's all of these things. And, you know, my, my philosophy on health is based around uh, prevention. Right. That's what we have to really be focused on. And prevention, uh, to me, the foundation for all of that is our diet. And, and yep. we have to eat right. And when you look at some of the shopping carts that people are pushing out the door, you're just like, oh, my God. Oh, my or goodness. You look in it's all scary. the center aisles with all of that processed food. I mean, right. God, what is in that stuff? 
<laughs> yeah, Jeff, your your everything you just said is the exact uh, reason and genesis for this podcast was taking a look at what was happening and what has been happening for decades in this country and in other parts of the world, but primarily in the U.S. The lack of um, uh, you know health knowledge and application of of eating better, getting exercise, sleeping better, uh, practices to reduce stress and anxiety, and taking care of our mental health. And it's led us to a health crisis. And then on top of that, we have a global pandemic. And it was just like this perfect storm for disaster. Oh, and that's really man. when I started this this podcast was to say, hey, guys, let's wake up and stop talking about putting Band-Aids over everything. And let's yes. be preventative and let's take action to take control of our health and do things that will prevent us from, from getting sick in the first place. You have to. That, that's, that's the way you have to look at it because so much of the medical system is based around treating a symptom and, and yep. they never actually get to the what's causing it. And because it's not right. a holistic practice, you, you go into a doctor's office and they don't you know, really want to know, okay, what's your history and tell me more about your diet and, and all that. No, they, they've got 15 minutes to like, okay, what's yeah. wrong? Okay, well, here, yep. here's your prescription. See you later. It, it's yep. not a functional system, uh, um, but that means people have to take responsibility for their own health. And that's where that's shows right. like yours are so important to be able to help educate people about mm. how you can take back some control and what you have to do, for example, whether it be diet or supplementation or yes. exercise. I mean, you have to move your body. You can't be That's sitting right. in a chair or on a couch. And, and you know, That's look, right. Dan, the world out there has become so virtual these days. Mm. And, and think about this last year where they're telling people to stay in and don't go out and Oh, that's great. I'll just sit on the couch and eat potato chips. It's like right. watch T and watch TV. That's going to help not get me any, a lot. <laughs> right. And not get any sunlight, you know, when we're looking at a vitamin D issue and then we're being exactly. told to stay exactly. inside. It's like yeah. totally backwards. I mean, totally. And, and, you know, we need fresh yeah. air. We need our lungs yes. to work and, and just yep. moving. So, so that, that in a sense has kind of pulled back the curtain more than we've mm. already pulled it back because you know like you and i know what's behind the curtain but for a lot of people they don't and it's just like right. scary when you think yeah. about all of the illness and people who are not really healthy and nobody is mm. you know certainly not the government is trying to help them out i mean my god right. Right. Yeah. yeah it's scary stuff, <laughs> scary stuff. really scary it's, it is so, yeah. Yeah, least... nothing scarier than those center aisles i'll tell you <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. So we've talked with mushrooms. We've talked about um, you know reishi, lion's mane, shiitake. What are some of the other main mushroom types that you enjoy for whether it be general wellness, uh, immunity boosting? Um, what are what are some of the other main mushrooms that are go tos for you? Well, well, you know. Um... First of all, a really interesting mushroom is cordyceps. Mm. And <clears throat> cordyceps uh, uh, traditionally has been wild crafted up in Tibet. And people are crawling around in season on their hands and knees trying to find this little thing because it's, it's actually a fungus that grows off a caterpillar that has been hibernating. And wow. it grows up off this caterpillar and it's about the size of the blade of grass. So people are up there combing on their hands and knees through the grass looking for these things. And that's the traditional wow. cordyceps. And today that traditional cordyceps is selling for about $15,000 a dried kilogram. So, so oh. it's not anything that would be in the supplement market here, but it's been something used for a long time for fatigue. Um, mm. so, so now we can actually cultivate that cordyceps and we can do it uh, in a very economical way so that we can bring cordyceps to everybody and it's not expensive at all and cordyceps is just mm. a fabulous mushroom the cordyceps that we grow is cordyceps militaris it's orange and it okay. is 
beautiful. And it is, um, you know, because, because um, of the whole idea that it's used for fatigue and for lack of energy, it's kind of been picked up by the whole kind of athletic uh, end of things and used mm -hmm. in those type of products, which seems like a reasonable place, but it's also got a lot of benefits in terms of immunological potentiation and, and also mm -hmm. for, for high altitudes as well, it seems to help. So cordyceps is really a cool mushroom. Um, the other one uh, um, that, let's just see, we've got, well, turkey tail, we've talked about that a little turkey bit. Tail, yeah. um, yep. Lion's mane, cordyceps, I mean, chaga, you probably heard mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot about chaga. Now, let me just say something about chaga. Um, first of all, you know, chaga. Have you ever seen a chaga? I've not. Oh, is it man. a big? Is it a real big mushroom? Chaga is actually not. Doesn't even look like a mushroom. It's just okay. this gnarly thing that's got a black surface and kind of a rusty color underneath, and it grows right off the side of a tree. So it's not oh. an actual mushroom, but it's produced by. A, a mushroom pathogen that has invaded a tree. It's been used okay. traditionally in um, Russia and, and Eastern Europe for its um, use with stomach issues, also for mm -hmm. immune enhancing. It's one of those things that, that if you go out on the internet and Google it, man, you'll, you'll see people say it's a panacea. There's nothing. It won't help. And, and when I wow. see that kind of thing, Dan, I'm like, Oh no! Please don't say that. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You know, I mean? you know what I mean? You know the kind of hype that gets out there sometimes in oh, the yeah. market for oh, whatever yeah. it is. And next thing you know, people are just hyping it like crazy. And chaga yep. is like that right now. And I, I just tell people, look, calm down. It's yeah. not a panacea. It doesn't do everything. Right. And and that kind of gets back to if you read research on any plants out there well you know the whole thing in plant research is is they're looking it's it's a, um, a matter of drug discovery so they're looking for some specific fraction as they're fractionating mm -hmm. this plant by extraction and then testing every fraction what is it in there that possibly has some activity and so they're testing it in a number of ways and if there's a certain activity against some particular, whether it be a uh, uh, cancer cell system or even HIV or something like that. Okay, maybe they find that in vitro. Mm -hmm. and, and then the next thing you know, somebody out here selling a product is going, oh, I've got this product and it cures cancer. Right. Like, whoa, right. whoa, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> so, it's a big so, statement. Yeah, well, and, and not only that, you can you can look at a lot of these mushrooms and people say, oh, yeah, well, well, there's science, scientific research that shows a hundred different benefits from this. And mm. I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I get it. But let's just back up down to where we can say, what is it used for traditionally? Um, what are the major things that it can do? Uh, because they mm -hmm. have actually done some tests with certain mushroom extracts where it shows, okay, it does have some antiviral activity against the AIDS virus. And that's where people go, woohoo. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's just in vitro research. Don't talk about that for God's yeah. sakes. And, and this is what yeah. we have to be always very careful with because, again, people will say, there's hundreds of benefits from this thing. I like to kind of boil it down to like three or four of the major right. findings in the research. And yep. again, remember, there's not a lot of clinical trials. Uh, most of it is in vitro with some in vivo, which means some animal trials. So that, you know, when you can take it up to the animal trials, that will give you more information. But clinical trials really is the best. And you have to be really careful too about what I call anecdotal yeah. information. You know, it, it's yep. great for you or me to share our experiences, but we shouldn't extrapolate that to others. We can say, oh, yeah, this is what it did for me. And it was like really helpful. And they go and try and they go, man, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So yep. this is where this is where in this kind of arena, we have to be careful how we present these things. And one of the last things that I will ever do is try and hype these things and talk about the mm -hmm. wonders of it. It's a wonder drug. It'll cure everything. Yep. And uh, it's only nine ninety five. and I'll throw in a pack of Ginsu knives. 
<laughs> well, I, I appreciate that that honesty and that directness because as you know, so many people, whether it's in the supplement world or just marketing in general, they like to throw claims out there and say that this product will cure everything. This product will cure cancer, yeah, this and that. Yeah, and that yeah. gets dangerous when a lot of people are starting to do that. And oh, uh, it's refreshing. It's really refreshing for someone like yourself to say, I like to take a step back and really look into the research and really focus in on, like you said, the top two, three kind of uh, main benefits and, and dive in a little further on that rather than saying, this has a hundred uses. Have at it. Yeah, yeah, I know. No, no, this is not a Swiss Army knife. I'm sorry. You know? Right, <laughs> right, exactly. So, so let, let's get real here. And look, you know, um, one of the things that's happened in this category is that, you know, I was telling you earlier that mushrooms do not sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they've all been picked by hand. They're very yep. expensive to grow, mushrooms yeah. are. So, so when you take your mushrooms into the marketplace in North America, if you're a mushroom grower, you can actually get a reasonable price for your fresh mushrooms. But remember, supplements are dried powders. So if mm -hmm. I have a pound of mushrooms here and I'm getting $5 for it and I dry that out, I have to get $50 for that same pound of mushrooms. So the oh. economics just do not work um, for growing mushrooms in uh, mm. the United States. And so what happens now is we were talking earlier about the different plant parts and the stages of this. What companies are doing now is they're actually growing out this mycelial stage mm -hmm. on sterilized grain at the end of the pro at the end of once it's grown out for 30 to 45 days the grain is all covered you see a lot of white mycelium there they will take it out dry it grind it to a powder grain and all mm. and then they will sell that as a mushroom supplement when wow. in fact what it is is mostly grain starch and wow. this is something that we we essentially, I did a white paper in 2015 where I have a test for beta glucans that also uh, will give me results for alpha glucans, which are the starches. And I was able to show in that after, after testing 95 different samples, 40 of which were these particular products that were what I call myceliated grain. And <clears throat> a mushroom or a mushroom extract is going to be around um let's just say 30 to 50 percent beta glucan less mm -hmm. than five percent alpha glucan which are the starches or that glycogen so less than five percent now these particular products are the exact opposite they're like five percent beta glucan um mm. and they're 30 to 60 percent alpha which is the starch well that's what you would kind of expect because they're selling you all of this grain with the mm -hmm. product and they're labeling the product mushroom. And, oh. and, and so, so when you can go into that, the store and you look on the supplement shelf and you see 50% of what you're going to see there, I'm not kidding, will be this type of product. It will say reishi mushroom and have a picture of a mushroom, but it will not be mushroom. It will be this myceliated grain product. So, wow. so a lot of people are taking these products thinking they're actually getting a mushroom supplement when all they're mm. actually getting is grain starch. And, wow. and so it's having absolutely no benefit whatsoever. So in terms of finding a quality mushroom supplement, whether that's at the local grocery store or somewhere online, how do I know I'm purchasing a quality mushroom uh, supplement? Well, the first thing that if it says grown in the United States, it is this grain product. Mm. It's that's pretty simple. You can look in the supplements facts panel and if it says mycelium, okay, you know, and if you look at the fine print, the more honest companies selling these not mushroom products will actually in the fine print, they'll say myceliated rice, myceliated oats. Oh. So they will actually wow. reveal it. But how many people, when they're buying that supplement, are looking at the fine print? 
Right. Not very many. And then and then the issue is that these same companies are selling their raw materials to others and they're selling them to other companies as mushroom. And those companies mm. then take it and go, oh, OK, I've just got a mushroom. So I'm just going to put mushroom on there. I'm not going to talk about the grain that's in there either. So a lot of people can you imagine a lot of people who are are paleo? They don't eat grains. They're buying yep. these mushroom products, thinking they're mushrooms when, in fact, they're a lot of grain. And here they are. They're trying to stay away from grains. Mm -hmm. Man. Uh, it's insane. That's, yeah, it's insane. That's a good way of putting it. It really is. And then in terms of testing, I think you've mentioned some testing methods, but are there any other testing methods that we haven't talked about in order to determine the quality of the product? Well, I've got a great one for you. Oh, man, this, this test is so cool because everybody can do it. It's called mm. the iodine starch test. Okay. So, so you uh, go to the pharmacy, buy a little bottle of iodine, a couple bucks. Yep. You, you come home, you have a quarter cup of water, and you take whatever product you happen to have there, like, and you, you empty out about four or five capsules into the water. You stir it up really good, make sure it's nice and wet, and it's all mm -hmm. there in that water. You put 10 drops of iodine in, and if there is starch in there, it will turn black. Wow. A mushroom does not have starch. So the mushrooms in there, you drop the iodine in, the water will turn the iodine color. Interesting. Um, now, that if, it, if it's a mushroom product and it's a darker product, the, the water may be dark to begin with. So that's a little bit more difficult. But the bottom line is that a lot of these other products with the grain in them they are pretty light and you stir it up and and let it settle it'll turn actual black boom black it is the coolest test in the world wow. and it's just this reaction of iodine to the starch it's just a standard chemical reaction very common and you can do huh. it with nothing more than a little bustle so, so all of your listeners out there if they have a mushroom product and they're going like well what about my product? Because look, I'm not going to, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> I'm not going to reveal the names that right. I want to do that, you know, but sure. if you've got a product and you want to test it, well, that's the, and the other thing too, is like, look, a mushroom product should have a mushroomy taste to it. A lot of these products, yeah. you, you look at them, it's a kind of a light powder and you taste them and they, they taste just like flour. I mean, you, you could literally probably empty out all your capsules and make bread with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a really neat test, though. I, um, oh, it's I'd be cool. interested to hear from, from others that are listening to this podcast if they wanted to reach out and let me know if they've, if they've done the test. And, oh, man, uh, it is such a really cool eye test. Yeah, it's such a cool you, yeah. you can even You can even you know, go online and say iodine starch test, and they'll be like, little three minute videos that'll show you and they'll do the test cool. and it's cool. just it's awesome it's That's really cool. awesome and, and yeah. you know the bottom line is mushrooms do not have starch they have glycogen which is small amounts and will not react that makes sense okay cool good to know why why a supplement a mushroom supplement you know we're talking about mushrooms and then we're talking about mushroom supplements why would I purchase a, a mushroom supplement rather than just have mushrooms in my diet or, or otherwise? Well, you know what? A, a, a couple of reasons. One of which is, okay, maybe maybe you're not into eating mushrooms. Maybe you're just like, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't want to do that. Or maybe maybe you travel a lot. Uh, I mean, mm. I travel a lot. And, and uh, if I'm traveling, man, you know, I, I mean... If I can, I try to have a kitchen, but at the same time, I'm not going to be doing the same kind of cooking that I might be if I'm at, at home, right? So yeah. the, thing about it, the thing about a supplement is, is, think about this for a second now. If I've got one gram of our mushroom extract, and, and let's just say it's a 10 to 1 extract, so 10 kilos makes one kilo of extract. So I've got mm -hmm. one gram of that. Well, that would come from basically 10 dried grams of mushrooms and but those 10 dried grams come from a hundred grams of fresh mushrooms yeah so okay. so you're getting in that one gram of extract you're getting a hundred grams of fresh mushrooms 
Mm. That that's a lot. I mean, and look, it's a lot, but I mean, I can sit down and I can eat 200 grams of, you know, that, that 200 grams is like, um, about a half a pound. I can eat a half a pound of mushrooms like that. No big deal. Mm. A lot of people maybe sure, would not be sure. eating that much, but I can, it's, it's not a problem. Yeah. I eat mushrooms like four or five times a week. No problem. Yeah. And, and that's just a common amount for me. I don't fool around with just a few little mushrooms. You know, one button mushroom, one medium sized button mushroom weighs approximately 40 grams, 40 mm. grams, you know? And wow. so, so let's just say that that's like five of these medium sized button mushrooms is 200 grams of fresh mushrooms. Five of those button mm -hmm. mushrooms, yeah, I'll chop up five and nothing. I mean, I mean, I'm probably doing yep. like six, seven, or eight of these things when I'm doing the button mushroom because yeah. when you when you cook them, they will they will shrink quite a bit. But sure, sure. that's yep. that's really one of the the reasons why you would do that. And and remember too, some mushrooms you can't eat in your diet, like reishi mushroom. Reishi mushroom right. is bitter. It is yep. like wood, so you mm -hmm. can't chew it up it would be literally like chewing on a stick i mean it right. is a hard woody mushroom and that's the same with yep. turkey tail same thing it's a, a kind of mushroom that's not a food mushroom chog is not a food mushroom so there are certain mushrooms where if you wanted to get them into your system in any way you'd probably have to go you'd pretty much have to go the supplement route because you're not going to be mm -hmm. cooking with them especially something like reishi which is very very bitter yep that's interesting so so jeff we've talked quite a bit about um medicinal mushrooms non-psychoactive mushrooms i'd love to hear your thoughts on uh the idea of of psychoactive mushrooms psychedelics where we've gone and you know how far we've come in the last even five ten years um and the reason why i'd love to get your input on this is because you were in this space of of mushrooms generally in the in the 60s 70s and onward uh so you very much were in that era of uh psychedelic use in in the 60s and 70s and then we kind of had this big gap of you know shutdown of of the we call that prohibition prohibition yeah right where and, and not only from from a legal use but more so of the the research behind it was really kind of put on a standstill. Absolutely correct. And now we're starting to pick that back up in terms of the, the research. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, especially in this era where uh, we were just talking about COVID and, and all of the implications that COVID brought about, the mental health uh, kind of uh, part of it was, was a big thing. You know, we talk about the virus and, and how scary it was um, for our bodies and for our immunity. But I don't know if we necessarily talk enough about how much it, how much damage it did for us, you know, with our mental health. So that's a big piece is uh, with psychedelics, that mental health piece. Uh, there's people that have PTSD, uh, PSD, PTSD, um, that are that are really getting a lot of benefits from it, um, and many other you know forms of trauma from their childhood through throughout life. Um, so what are your uh, your thoughts on on psychedelics? and some of the uses and benefits that we can get from them? Well, first of all, let me just say, I never thought that they would lift prohibition in my lifetime. Just like I never thought yeah. they were going to legalize cannabis in my lifetime. I was really mm -hmm. like, um, so I'm really encouraged by that. Totally encouraged by that. That's just a wonderful thing because look, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that, that, um, Back in the 60s and 70s, yes, we were, we're experimenting with the psycho, psychoactive uh, plants, whether it be mushrooms or LSD or these kind of things, but it was all illegal. Even smoking cannabis right. was illegal. I have friends that spent time in prison. It, it, was, it yeah. was a difficult time when they brought in the prohibition and it closed down all research on it, which was really unfortunate. You know, when you, when you look back at the history of mushroom use, Dan, it goes back thousands and thousands of years it's really yeah. really interesting and what happened was in the 50s they discovered that there was actually an indigenous group in mexico still using mushrooms in their healing mm. ceremonies it's just like 
oh my God, we're in the 20th century and people are still using mushrooms in a, you know, psychoactive mushrooms in a medicinal way. Right. It was, it was fantastic. It was amazing. Yeah. And when yeah. that, when that um, information got out, it really started to open up the doors and everybody's like, wow, what is going yep. on here? And certainly with the same with, with the fact of discovery of LSD and, and that started to get used in, in a, uh, a clinical setting and then kind of got away into the, the population. And so, so yeah, I, I, and, and look, the, the issue too was that we didn't have guides. <laughs> we didn't have guidelines. So, yep. so it was really a, a time of experimentation. And, and remember, that was a counter culture because the culture mm -hmm. at that time was very, very <laughs> like this, you know, not open yep. to anything except stay between these two lines. So we were right. really pushing the boundaries in so many different ways. So um, now the fact that, that there are practitioners that are utilizing psilocybin for yep. uh, mental health issues, end of life issues, addiction yep. issues with tremendous mm. success. Um, it is just really something that I'm so happy about. And I, I even listened to a um, um, presentation by a psychologist in Victoria, British Columbia about a month ago. And he mm -hmm. has a license to use psilocybin and he has a number of patients and he was talking about some of his experiences with it. And, and I just found that so refreshing that we're in a time when we can actually talk about this. I mean, my God, mm -hmm. you know, you have yeah. to remember that we went through a whole period where you had to be very careful of who you talked to and what you said. And, and uh, yes. because it was, we're talking about something that's illegal and people are in jail for. So, so it's really right, right. an interesting time now that that is, has, has changed. I hope they can maintain the momentum here. I'm really happy that all of a sudden they're looking at psychoactives in a different way because I think they are, have tremendous and profound implications for us in terms of our knowledge and, and, you know, even just, the access to different realms within our personal self, different dimensions, so to speak, and, and opening up uh, as human beings in, in mm. many different ways is just is absolutely wonderful. And, and if it's allowed to go forward, it could really have some profound changes on society. And I would like to think that those will be very positive. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's so interesting to hear from someone like yourself who has been in this space for, in terms of mushrooms as a whole, for a large part of your career. I mean, you've seen, now I'm going back to psychoactive mushrooms, uh, you've seen like, you know, exploration, prohibition, back to exploration and further research. And now you're seeing, you know, today's uh, world of starting to accept a little bit more and learn more about it and like you said not too long ago it was very hush hush and now i think it's you know things like podcast and other forms on online where people have these platforms to safely and comfortably talk about it and learn about it and explore a little further and start realizing Hey, maybe this can have a use in my life, whether that's, you know, therapeutically for, you know, healing trauma or, you know, uh, like you said, addiction, um, healing, healing addiction, or even just from a productivity standpoint, you know, whether that's microdosing or, you know, exploring with different doses to improve your mood, improve your productivity. And at the end of the day, improve your life. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. Well, yeah. And not only that, I, I fully support the use of these things recreationally if they're done in the right setting. You know, I, I right. don't approve of them being used in somebody's out driving a car or off willy nilly, right. uh, but in a recreational space too, with a group of friends, um, you know, in a nice setting. Yeah. Enjoying yeah. yourself with these, even, even going out into nature and, and mm. feeling the connection 
with the natural yes. world, which, which Dan, that's one of the other sides of it right now that is really missing is people have lost the connection to the natural world. Mm. They're not getting yep. out. They're not getting their, their hands in the dirt. They're not out there and, you know, playing in the, the water and, and all the rest and, and really feeling the beauty of trees and forests and just the nature in general. And that is, that is also, yes. I, I mean, you know, it's funny because now there's actually groups that will take you out into the forest for, you know, getting to know the forest. And I'm like, oh my God, is that where we are now? It's kind of like taking, oh, come on kids, we're going to take you out to the farm country and show you how food is grown. <laughs> like, right. Oh exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. It's a yeah, very interesting yeah. time. I will I, say that was one of the most uh, enjoyable kind of new practices that I picked up during COVID and, and really just in the last year and a half in general is getting back out into nature and learning about nature, enjoying uh, the, the many things that it has to offer, whether it's the trees or the fresh air, or the sunshine, um, certain plants. I mean, it's it, it, there are so many things in nature that I have neglected pretty much my entire life. You know, yeah. it's just like blindfolders on. You just walk through, and you, especially my neighborhood. I'm I'm in Chicago in in a big city, but uh, at least I'm in more of a neighborhood setting. And yeah. now I go on walks. I'm like, whoa, there's trees, like a lot of trees, and there's birds chirping and. I mean, if you really just take the time to stop and reflect and enjoy the moment, and I know that all sounds really hippy dippy, but uh, there's a lot there to explore. You know, even grounding is something I've gotten into. It's take your socks and shoes off, and get your feet onto grass. You've lost that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and you know, look, there's nothing wrong with hippy dippy at all. I, right. You know, it's like it, 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 and and you know, it's it's too bad that it's kind of like got some kind of negative connotation because when you think about it, right. here are people that wanting wanting to be close to nature. They didn't want to consume a lot. Um, very simple life, but more plugged in, and that's where we that's need right. to go. That's absolutely that's where right. we need to go. Yes, I agree. Well, Jeff, this has been such a great conversation. I really enjoy speaking with you. Um, before I get to my last question, where can people learn more about you and, and the work that you're doing? Well, our, our website is namex.com, N-A-M-M-E-X.com. I've got a ton of great content there for you. I've got slideshows about how we grow our mushrooms, about what to nice. look for in products. So there's a lot of great educational material there. And it's the same, our, our um, consumer brand is Real Mushrooms and you can go to realmushrooms.com. Again, mm. they've got a ton of great content there. It's just amazing. So come for the content. If you wanna try the products, realmushrooms.com. I think they even give you 25% off your first uh, purchase, but a lot of very good information if you wanna learn more about mushrooms. Awesome. I will be checking that out myself and I'll have that linked up in the description as well. Um, awesome. Very cool. So Jeff, I like to end the conversation around your definition of health. So my question is, what does health mean to you? Well, first of all, health means feeling good. And, and mm -hmm. to feel good for me means I'm eating well, I'm exercising every day, and I'm also getting out into my community and I live in a small town and and utilizing my body. I, I'm really into mm. walking. And so I'll walk, I mean, for an hour and a half, two hours a day, I can walk down wow. to the beach. And in my community, we actually have a separate walking path from the road. So you can nice. be on your bike, you got skateboard, you can walk, whatever. I can walk into the town or walk down to the beach. So I love to get out and you, you have to move and you have to maintain this consciousness. And the other thing too is just, you know, don't worry about thinking about things or anything like that. Just let your mind empty and enjoy everything around you. Mm. I love that. That's something I'm working on quite a bit lately is uh, not worry so much about the future or the next meeting that I have or the project that I have to get done by tonight. Sure, those are, you know, time and place for all of that. 
and, and with productivity, but uh, slowing things down and enjoying the present moment. There's so much beauty there. Oh, absolutely. You know, just as an example, Ev, I'm on my walk and I'm walking by a, a rhododendron or some beautiful flower. I'm going to stop. I'm just yep, going to yep. sit there and look at it, the brilliant colors of it. Um, yes. Same if I see a bee flying around and I'm going to stop and watch this going on. Take the time to really enjoy yes. what's going on. There's a lot going on that you miss if you do not slow down. Yes, that's right. I just recently had a podcast guest on. His name is Jeff as well, and he's in Chicago here with me. Uh, so this kind of this practice works a little bit better if you're like in a city with corners and everything, but you can certainly use it if you have uh, more of a rural uh, environment. But his advice was whenever you go for a walk and you get to the corner and you turn, before you make that turn while you're walking, before you turn left or right, just stop and take a look around and notice something different, whether it's a cool door that's painted or a bird or a, a tree you've never paid attention to before. Just take a quick second and notice something new. And I've been doing that the last few weeks. It's, it's a really cool practice. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's very cool. That's great advice. It's mindfulness, right? It's, it's enjoying yeah, that presence. Absolutely. So. Yeah, cool. Well, Jeff, this has been such a pleasure. I really appreciate your time and, and joining me and sharing your expertise on, on mushrooms. I've learned a ton today. I, I know my audience will as well. So thank you very much. Hey, you're welcome, Dan. It's, it's been my pleasure talking to you.